15th meeting. We're going to call the meeting to order and we'll start by adjourning. We'll adjourn, adjourn as the HCOG board and convene as the policy advisory committee. And then next on the agenda is public participation. So this item is reserved for matters that are not on the agenda that may be presented to the public over which PAC has jurisdiction. Is there anyone in the public wishing to address the HCOG board on something that's not on the agenda? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public participation. And next we have approval of meeting record. Do we have a motion? I make a motion to approve the meeting record. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay. Abstain. Um, absta abstain. We have one abstention. Next we have consent calendar. By motion, we approve the following item, items considered to be routine and enacted in one motion. Items may be removed from the consent calendar and will be heard separately. A is approval of the City of Fortuna's fiscal year 2019-20 local transportation fund claim. B is approval of the Humboldt Transit Authority's fiscal year 2019-20 local transportation fund claim for the Eureka Transit Service. And C is approval of the fiscal year 2018-19 regional surface transportation program allocations. Is there anyone on the board want to remove anything from the consent calendar? Anyone in the audience which wish to remove anything from the consent calendar? Okay, I want to remove the C, just to have a couple questions about it. So can we get a motion to um, approve items A and B? I'll move that we approve consent calendar items A and B. Okay, motion and second. All those in favor say aye. 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 And I just, um, I was reading through C, and on page four of C, I just noticed that our um, remaining regional apportionment amounts, that that was set in the 1990s. And is there, I feel like maybe there was a discussion about this a couple years ago, but I just wondered if, if there's any effort to, to look at those proportions. Um, because it strikes me that McKinleyville, 15%, is sort of underselling McKinleyville, and yet I also wasn't sure if the county also gets stuff, so maybe McKinleyville's covered in that way. So those are just some questions I had. Yeah, so the county, there's a um, exchange in the, in the beginning. Um, there's the transit set aside, the county of Humboldt, 100,000. They take that off, and then our like reimburse that in a sense. Um, and the, and I think what you're remembering from a few years ago is that um, staff did query the technical advisory committee about other ways to approach this fairly convoluted um, way of distributing it. And the members at that time felt like um, they understood it well enough and it ended up being proportioned the, the way that they um, felt was appropriate. Okay, thanks. I just kind of wanted to remind myself what that was and what the conversation was. So, do we have a motion to approve consent I, I calendar? Have a question, Sue. Oh, question? Um, you know, so the County of Humboldt 839 is 15% McKinleyville comes out of that, but so does uh, the rest of the county, right? Let me see, let me get back to the papers uh, there. 839. Because down below the allocations are, are by cities, and then up above talking that percentage is, you know, it's not really relatable. Uh, I see the 15% in McKinleyville, but the 839, is that what you said? 839,000, the RSTP allocation. Yeah. Page two of the staff. Report. Oh, page two of the staff. Yeah. I'm sorry, it's still on page four. Does that, uh, oh, I, I'm, I'm sure that 839 includes McKinleyville. But it's not broken down. Why bother telling me about McKinleyville when we're not telling me about the HCD area? Oh, could you please turn your mic on? Okay, maybe I'm just not talking into it. Oh, okay. Yes, they said we can't hear you. Yeah, sorry. Can you repeat the question? Okay, if you look at page 2, 5C, 15% McKinleyville. Right. Um, but the uh, allocations, the down below, it's the county of Humboldt, 839, 839,000. I mean, I, I'm not getting a re correlation between this stuff. And you know, your question seems to be, 
why are we calling McKinleyville out separately up above? Good. Thanks for digging in there. And then it's just incorporated within the county of Humboldt. Right. I mean, below. I, I don't know how to talk about the rest of the unincorporated out, outside of the say well. So in essence, the 227,111 for Eureka would represent 46.6%. Right. Is that what you're, okay. Yeah. yeah. So if I may, the, the apportionments to Eureka Arcade and McKinleyville Fortuna are based on being the FAU federal aid urban FAU recipient, so okay. I believe we're just keeping that technical dis okay. uh, distinction in those FAUs at the top, as opposed to the lumping county of Humboldt. Okay. Thanks. Well, and there's a part of me that trusts the TAC because I yeah. know that they look at these things, you know. So if they're happy with it. Well, in that case, I'll make a motion that we approve item C from the consent calendar. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Okay, now we are on item seven, PAC action items. Priority list for federal transportation bill negotiations. Okay, yes, thank you. So I'm presenting this uh, on behalf of Marcella, who is in Sacramento on business. Um, so as the staff report summarizes, in June, Congressman Huffman had a roundtable for local agents um, with jurisdiction, as, as it were, over um, big infrastructure. And he was asking what kinds of needs are in the area for um, big projects that would need federal funding to be able to get off the ground. And he's asking for a list of priority uh, projects. The, th there's no uh, qualifier or criteria per se, but um, he is basically looking for something that would be over five million dollars. Um, he didn't actually require that, but you know we're thinking to go for a federal project. Much less than that is not really worth the effort. Um, and so um, Marcella went to the technical advisory committee and asked for priority projects, and they have presented these uh, this list of candidate projects that. Um, our priority for having regional significance and again being over the five million dollar mark and um, we have a few of uh, representatives here to tell you about the projects that they would like to be put on the list okay thank you so do we have some people in the public that would like to come forward good afternoon HCOG board and um, chairman thank you for the opportunity I just wanted to take a few minutes and emphasize um, the project that the city of Fortuna put forward it's really an important project to the city and there haven't been a lot of large projects in the in the Eel River Valley and so I think this is one that um, deserves the board's consideration um, as for one of the top priorities for for this prioritization list so I just wanted to run through this quickly and I'd be happy to answer questions after I go through that but essentially um, there's three connections in Fortuna on Highway 101, the Kenmar interchange, the 12th Street interchange, and the North Main Street. Two of the interchanges, the uh, Kenmar and the 12th Street, really present a barrier between the city of Fortuna proper and the Riverwalk area. No pedestrian connectivity, and there's a lot of other issues that I'll explain to you in just a minute. But we've combined two projects that were com we've done as under a sustainable communities grant from Caltrans. We did a pretty comprehensive document. I think it was presented to this board in the past. We 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 um, converted that into a project initiation document for the Kenmar and very quickly could complete a project initiation document for 12th Street as well. So, and the Kenmar interchange project also has $550,000 planned for um, preliminary engineering environmental documents. So I know in the prioritization they were looking at planned projects. Both of these are in the regional transportation plan as well as one of them is underway and has some planning money but no construction money as of yet. So um, it would, the project includes improvements to the 101 interchange at 12th and Kenmar. Really the big pluses from this would be they'd allow the future planned growth in Fortuna and also at the mill site within Fortuna and they provide access to a number of recreational areas which we're, we're looking at improving within the city and anticipated cost is about $33 million. 
Um, the project need, uh, first of all, just a little bit about the layout. This shows the roadway network. You can see these are the city of Fortuna streets right here. Um, Riverwalk being over here on the left. Uh, Fortuna Boulevard, Newburgh Road, and 12th Street uh, in, in the center. Those, and then you can see Ronerville Road, which turns into Main Street along the north side. Here's the, what we were calling the downtown area of Fortuna, really the historic portion of the downtown. Here's the Riverwalk area. And you can see the former mill site in green. Um, and then there's Strong Street that runs along the bottom, and you can see Highway 101, which really bisects the community. And there's the two interchanges we're talking about, the 12th Street interchange and the Kenmar interchange. So that's where the project is focused at those two locations. But really the highway bisects the community and separates the um, Riverwalk area from the downtown. Uh, and as I'll tell you in a minute, the, the level of service for, for the traffic is going to fall below acceptable standards, and there are no pedestrian facilities to link the two. There's existing configuration is confusing, complex, and inefficient, and I will show you some pictures in a moment. There's excessive vehicle queuing on the off-ramps, and there's limited pedestrian and bicycle facilities. And really, they don't present a sense of place. There's really a, the, the interchanges don't allow for that, and we think there's a lot of room for improvement. And ultimately, they'll limit the future development of the city. So really the opportunities are to improve the access for all users, increase the capacity and reduce vehicle queuing delays, improve safety, and allow for the city's planned growth and the redevelopment of the former Palco mill site. Here's just some pictures of the existing conditions. This is not on a bad day at all. This is the Kenmar off-ramp, um, but you'll, you'll, it's not uncommon to see vehicles take, you know, commuters coming from Eureka taking the Kenmar exit and queuing all the way back onto the highway, creating a safety issue. Um, and then left-hand turns are very difficult coming off of Yule River Drive, and that's already operating, I believe, at a, at a level of service E or F. There's no pedestrian connectivity you see right now. Anybody who wants to walk from for the Fortuna downtown, this is their option really in the shoulder of the roadway or behind the guardrail. Certainly not accessible for those um, that are mobility impaired or for bikes. This is what we came up with. We have, a, again, we have a comprehensive document that looked at environmental right-of-way, um, did the engineering, the traffic engineering. So we, we looked at a number of alternatives, and this is the one we settled on. And it's not unlike the double roundabouts that are at Giantoli. They're a little more tricky. There's a railroad that goes through the middle of this one. Um, but the elements essentially include aligning the northbound ramp and the Eel River Drive uh, connection to the roundabout to meet current standards. The existing bridge would remain with this alternative, so it keeps costs relatively low for the Kenmar interchange, and then it would have a, connect, a class one bike path that would connect the two, connect both sides of the highway. And you can see this right here, that's the southerly driveway of the Palco Mill site. So a number of development proposals have come in for the Palco Mill site. People have looked at in the past, but the first thing they run into when they do traffic analysis is that they're going to impact those interchanges. And so that usually, you know, seeing a $10 million price tag um, at the beginning end of their project usually puts those um, development ideas to rest. And it also included a retaining wall, such as the one shown in this picture on the left, to allow for better connection pedestrian connectivity and here's just a this is a photo of an existing one that's at another location and here's a photo sim we did a while back that shows another concept that could be for the retaining wall that goes under um, the Kenmar interchange 12th Street this is a very confusing intersection I think it has this is where Newburgh Road intersects uh, 12th Street but you are at a sharp angle there's wide pavement high speeds and we see a number of accidents there and a lot of people avoid that intersection because it is so difficult and 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 hard to get across and there's long queues and then this is these are just some photos on the top that you can see the pedestrian connectivity is essentially non-existent and even parts of it there's not even a shoulder for people to walk on so you see walkers and bikers in the middle of the road and worst case is we see some of the folks who work on the riverwalk side jumping across the fence in the middle of the highway it's actually shorter and flatter and so they choose to go that way so uh, desperately needs pedestrian improvements. And here is a very confusing intersection. This is uh, the intersection where the city's courtyard is. This comes from the river walk and where ecology and our transfer station is and the Highway 101 off-ramp. Very confusing, long queues. Um, it, it's, it's difficult and ultimately will become one of those spots that really bottlenecks the development um, and the access for the river walk area. And that's just the location map down at the bottom left. Real quickly, level of service. Um, you know, it's like letter grades in school, A through C is generally acceptable, and DEF are generally unacceptable. 
um, with the existing volumes. You can see that the Kenmar, there's, you know, the best uh, leg of the intersection is a C and an F, 12th Street, there's an F and a D. Kenmar Road, Eel Road Drive is a, is, a, is a E and E. So we're already starting to operate below the acceptable level of service at those locations. Um, the seven of the 10 of the intersections are expected to operate below the level of service C with the city's plan growth. So these two interchanges present a huge barrier to the city. Here's the preferred alternative for 12th Street. This is the portion, the city's corp yard, Mercer Fraser Yard comes here. Now it comes out to that confusing intersection, which is down here. So there'd be a realignment and a connection to, to um, 12th Street closer to the, the interchange and a roundabout that would be placed at the intersection of Riverwalk Drive and in the highway on, on and off ramps. And there's a realignment. There would also be a class one bike path that goes across um, the overcrossing and widening of the bridge, which I'll show you more on that in a second. This is a part that's really exciting. I think for a lot of people, if you've been to Fortuna and you've seen 12th Street, this is that really horrible intersection that comes, your, if you come on Newburgh Road and you have to kind of look over your shoulder at an angle that's uncomfortable to, to go onto 12th Street and get to the freeway off ramp, that would be dead ended, turned into a cul-de-sac. And then you'd see a realignment of Newburgh Road through the corner of the Palco Mill site, which is right here. This is the northerly end of that. And then you, there's, you know, we've, we've already done extensive outreach with the businesses. Sequoia Gas is located on these parcels and owns those parcels. Clinden and Cider Works here. And so we figured out a plan that would enable them to have good connections to the, the new planned roundabout. And then, of course, bike lanes and sidewalks. Here's just a rendering of, you know, a, or a schematic of what the bridge would look like and the structural engineering feasibility has already been done for that. So we know that we can widen it and get pedestrian connectivity across that, that interchange. Excuse me, that over, overpass. And just to give you a photo uh, idea, here's um, looking from uh, the off ramp down towards 12th Street. Here's the simulation of what that would look like. Really, you can see some of the great things about this. It would give you some directional signs, a sense of place. It wouldn't look just like this. This is just kind of an early concept, but definitely letting you know you would have arrived in the city of Fortuna. And here's looking at um, with a similar photo sim, just looking um, westerly towards the Riverwalk area from 12th Street. And again, the same concept for the roundabout was introduced here. You can see the, the bike lane, the bike trail on the right. You can see the, the smaller crossings. And the roundabouts really have a lot of features for safety that I think this board's probably seen. I think most of your communities have them, or at least a lot of them do, and, or people have driven these. So I think it's, it's recognized that they function well for improving the level of service, and they reduce the potential of conflicts with vehicle interaction. So this is the other exciting part where, you know, this is a, a photo from Street View uh, from Google Earth on the mill site. And it's, it's, it's a pretty big blighted area, just a flat 75 acres. Here's an aerial photo that shows it. A lot of potential. These are just some renderings from some other master plans for other communities. But that's, you know, I think this is one of the things that really can make this regionally significant. You know, 75 acres right on Highway 101. There's not a lot of land like that right now um, in, in by making that land accessible, we could really think about what type of development could could go well there and could benefit the county as a whole. Right now, it's has a little bit of schizophrenic. Uh, uh, it's it's a little disjointed between the land use and the zoning. It's it's designated now in the general plan as um, mixed use, which could allow for some housing and then also business development. And then I think in the zoning, it's in in industrial. So. We have some work to do there to sort that out, but really it's a it's a blank canvas for, you know, what could be needed there. And there's a lot of potential and something that's in the middle of the city adjacent to Highway 101. And we really want to see something good happen there in the future. And I know uh, Board Member Avis probably could give you a little more detail on that than I could from his work on the, on that site in the past. So with that, that's all I really have. Um, and, you know, I just I think that the city of Fortuna and the Eel River Valley, there's been a number of big projects in the north end of the county. You know, although we've seen some projects on 101 for the Highway 36 101 interchange, that was really a Caltrans different project. But, you know, this is, you know, I'd say the equivalent of, you know, the Eel River Valley safety corridor project. We have unsafe crossings and without some type of an earmark, it's unlikely that we'd be able to gobble up all the money that normally comes through the regional transportation improvement program. A project like this couldn't proceed without some type of earmark and if it does it's going to take decades and decades and right now even though we have some of the you know preliminary money for some of the pre preliminary steps you know we'd have to suck all the money from the region in order to make something like this happen in the future so um that's really why i wanted to be here today is just to emphasize the importance of the city and you know if we don't see some type of earmark the unlikely possibility that it would happen 
you know, with a price tag of about $33 million. So that I'd be happy to, happy to answer any questions. Okay. Thanks, Mark. Any, any questions on the board? Thank you. Oh, um, I, I have a question. Okay. We want you to go. What about the interconnectivity of the bike trails? Now you've got showing bike trails going across the, in the new areas. How yeah. about up 12th Street and some of the connectivity to through the city and on 12th Street and then out, off to the river Riverwalk area? We'll yeah, so there's, you know, with all the developments that are happening, we've had, um, we've been installing bike lanes when we have new projects that come through. We also have some trails over on the Riverwalk side. We have the Sandy Prairie Levee Trail. That's a county trail. Um, one of the other things that we're looking at, we received a River Parkway grant to establish a seven acre riverfront park over there. The city's also pursuing the John Campbell um, Memorial Greenway or the Strong's Creek Trail. So with the development that's been happening, we applied for ATP funds twice for that. And this year we applied for ATP funds on Redwood Way. You know, initially we were very close. We tied for a funded project for the John Campbell Trail, but right now our region, you know, although there has been a few big projects, there's been fewer of them. I believe the county got the, you know, their portion of the Bay Trail between Arcata and Eureka, but we just haven't been sex successful with ATP funds. So the connections would be to bike lanes on either side and the city's working on those kind of incrementally as, 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 we, as we can, but no other big projects for, for bike That's lanes. the same question I had, so. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Any further questions? Okay. Thank you, Merritt. Um, is there anyone else? Does Tom, you want to come up? Tom Madsen, Director of Public Works for Humboldt County. I want to talk a little bit about our projects, um, just a little bit more than what's in there. We've been working very closely with the McKinleyville uh, Advisory Committee um, on looking at improvements, public improvements in McKinleyville. But again, the, the funding that's necessary, looking at the STIP, it's not going to be there, and we're all going to be c competing with each other. So we would, you know, like you to just get this list of earmarks to the congressman and push to get them all because we could add many, many, many more. Uh, but the ones that we've listed, McKinleyville, we're already working with the McMack on com community improvements. We've got a subcommittee set up to look at non-motorized non access throughout the community and looking to really transform the community and, and like Merritt said, make it a sense of place. Right now it's a sense of an old highway that you drive through. Um, the Garberville Complete Streets project, that's really a gateway to Humboldt County project. Um, we have some advanced funds that we are doing design with right now and working with the community. We have a number of community members that are looking to do significant investments in their properties along Redwood Drive as we do this project, looking at you know extended sidewalks, sidewalk cafes, uh, trying to get people to stop when they hit Humboldt County and, and spend that extra night or extra day coming through. Or any, uh, I mean, uh, the Hammond Trail replacement project, that's a critical component of the Hammond Trail and, and the overall county trail system. We've applied a number of times to get funding, but of course, since it's an existing structure and it's not a highway bridge, there's really no funding for it. Then, well, why don't you maintain it? Well, it's kind of, you know, you can only maintain it so long before it falls apart. And so we have applied for funding for that and other sources and have been turned down. But we, it's very critical that that bridge remain to, to, to make our system connected all the way, especially once we get the Bay Trail in, we get the Annie Mayo Trail in, we've got the Little River Trail out there that in, in planning mode, that, that this bridge is a critical junction. And then, then the Navy Base Rehab Project, with all the work the port is doing to enhance uh, economic activity out there, unfortunately, Navy Base Road is worn out. And we, you know, we're not talking about a, a, a you know, widening or a major thing. We're talking about that road needs total reconstruction. And it would help move the, the equipment back and forth. And we could add bike lanes at that time because we have sufficient right away. So those are our projects if you have any questions. Thanks, Tom. Does anyone have questions on right. the board? Okay. Got a couple of questions. First is um, about the uh, McKinleyville area. Is there, is, I, I, from this, I wasn't sure. Were you talking about fixing uh, the road all the way out to the Highway 101 um, north of McKinleyville? Well, we're, we're actually working with Caltrans and uh, uh, RCAA and the McMack 
looking at the South Gateway entrance primarily. How about but, the north area? But we're looking at the north area for shoulders down to Clam Beach. Right. We're, and we're looking at entrance, all the entrance roads, Murray Road, uh, the, the roundabout possibly at Murray Road and at the top of the hill uh, at Bella Vista to, to define where you enter the community. Hey, and the other question is about the Hammond Bridge. Is that, is, do you know what the length of time we can look at before that bridge may be closed if it's that dangerous? We've done, uh, you know, we've been able to find funding to put off the closure for quite some time, and it's not imminent, but it will be in 10 or 15 years, and by the time you go through the process to build a bridge, it's 10 or 15 years. And so, the, you know, securing construction funding sooner rather than later is very, very important. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay, thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else in the public wish, wish to address the board? Okay, seeing none, I'll close public comment. Steve. Yeah, I wonder if I could ask staff to clarify what we are intended to do this afternoon now that we've got this list and we've had presentations. So if you would direct staff on uh, forwarding a letter to the congressman with a list of priority projects, they can be all the projects on this list, they can be as you see them, alphabetical or any way that you might deem to prioritize them or uh, tell us how we should present it in the order to the congressman. Thank you. I have a question and also a comment. Um, so it sounds to me like you said that the um, congressman is looking at something that's around $5 million. Is that what I heard you say? Um, not quite. Okay. No, he's looking for big projects, right. and um, the discussion at the Technical Advisory Committee was, well, let's not put forward anything under five million because at the federal level, it's that it, it's not appropriate okay. for the time put in. Okay. And then the other thing I want to do is just a a little comment about the Annie and Mary Rail Trail because a lot of people in Blue Lake have been working very hard to see this advance, it would be something that would bring tourism to our area. It's a, a real cornerstone of, of some of the work that's been done in our town. And it goes right through town, right next to our uh, railroad depot, which is now our Blue Lake Museum, uh, next to our city hall, next to our park. And it does connect with the Hammond Trail eventually. And um, so I just want to put in a good word for the Annie and Mary Rail Trail. <laughs> Once this package is uh, sent on to the congressman, what happens to it at that point? He is asking this from all of his constituents, so it would be added to every other list that he's gotten from Humboldt as well as Trinity and Del Norte, and he will keep those in his mind, um, in his portfolio when he is negotiating the infrastructure bill. Great. Thank you. Okay, any further discussion? Well, in that case, um, yeah, yeah, I, um, I think a point that, that was made is that a number of these projects are continuations of projects that have been worked on over the decades, over the years, and there hasn't really been anything much from the south area. Um, the Garberville project seems good, and of course, I'd be interested in the uh, Fortuna project because that's a, an up and coming shopping area. The mill does represent a lot of potential growth in that area of the Eel River Valley, and I think making things accessible in that region will aid a lot of people um, coming up from Garberville without having to go all the way to Eureka, people from Ferndale and so forth. So I see that as a good central place to look at putting some, some funding. And the project does accomplish a number of uh, objectives that, uh, that HCOG has stated that it wants to, to try to meet. If I can add to that, building on the statement of the length of time this has been worked on, I was myself was in meetings with Caltrans staff probably six years ago or so. So this is not something that just came up. It's been being worked on. And I was surprised how many people that work for Caltrans live in Fortuna and knew about the problem with the connectivity before we even brought it forward. But some of the things that 
are really interesting is the number of people that work at the motels, the restaurants, the transfer station, um, the retail uh, tractor supply that walk to work or bike to work that you saw the pictures in there and it's literally a dicey thing to get to their place of employment and in the winter time it gets dark earlier and the area especially around Kenmar is difficult to deal with so this is something that we've looked at on a number of fronts not just a retail out, um, area but just a safety project and bicycle connectivity to the trails and the retails. <clears throat> I'd like to add to that as a, after working in Fortuna for a long, a number of years and being an avid biker riding around, it was, it is difficult at times, but I'm more worried about the kids trying to get back and forth. I know that it'd be nice to be able to connect things, but also, um, you know, the whole McKinleyville, McKinleyville's Central Avenue, a lot of McKinleyville is, is terrible for, uh, people getting around on bicycles too, or or uh, walking. So uh, I think that uh, for years I've felt McKinleyville was a very dangerous area. In fact, people avoid driving Central all the way out to Highway 101 because it's so bad for, on bikes. It's so hard you can't get off the road. You have to ride on the road. Um, I think that's a very important part of this project too. And of course the the Hammond Bridge. I mean, if, well, I think we need to consider how. Uh, I, how long it's going to take to replace that, and that would be a terrible, uh, terrible thing to, to lose because that's a very popular area. It connects um, McKinleyville to Arcata through uh, a nice trail system, so you don't have to get get onto the highway or use other ways. So I, it, it's really hard to decide uh, which of these is most important and what we should really choose. And so I'm. Luna, is that what we're doing? Is we're actually choosing an order? Or do, I mean, it's 123 million dollars. You, do, you so. do not. You do not have to choose an order, but you could pull out priorities if you saw fit. Um, you can uh, uh, have all of these projects on the in the letter and um, it this is in no way um, limiting what we forward to the congressman. Well what we forward would be what we felt were the most important items at this time and those would probably be the high the projects that we chosen first. Is that possibly what we'd see so we might be able to say this is what we would like to consider the most important? You could, but this entire list also could be, this is a list of what we find is most important. That's what I thought. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, I, could I say something? Okay. Yeah, um, I've looked them over for me, and I, and I uh, for lots of reasons, have a four top and the rest, whatever order they need to be. But I think that it helps decision makers when we say these are our top priority projects, and so I've done that in my mind. You want to hear them? Um, sure, I suppose so. Yeah. So I think the Ken Moore is number one, the uh, Fortuna project number one, the electric bus because it serves all the county, number two, Annie Mary number three because it's been on forever and McKinleyville number four because it needs to be done, but it is in the north, and I think the south needs the attention first, and that's why Kenmore is primary for me. Okay, thank you, Paul. Um, I, I'd like us to think a little bit that possibly there could be different funding sources for different things. So, you know, moving all these forward, it could be that there's more, you know, um, transit type of money and that might go to the microgrid for electric bus and there there could be bridge money that's put out there and there could be you know totally rehabilitating roads as opposed to you know making them better and safer as in Kenmar so there's a part of me that would just make an argument to move all these forward if you know if if people want to prioritize them and put them one two three four we could try to do that and see if we can agree on that but um, I feel like, again, as I said earlier, I really trust the TAC. Um, you know, when I first came into HCOG, I didn't quite tr trust the TAC. That's one reason I think I really have come to the appreciation that I do, because I think they work really well together, and they're all technically involved in all these things, and they, they came up with this list. And so um, 
Yeah, I kind of I, I kind of thought that we came to H Cog and we fought each other for our right to do stuff. I mean, that was just my silly idea. But um, and now I've come to realize, no, it's much more civil than that. And actually, it's pretty well done, and people support each other's projects, and and I appreciate that very much. So there's a part of me just feels like I'd be happy to just move all these forward um, if we want to prioritize. That's another conversation we could have. Stephen, how is the sequence of projects on the list put together and where it's which one ended up first second third and fourth and so on as received okay so are you a person can I can oh, speak yes. Sorry. Okay. as I just wanted to point out as a funding agency that the earmarks is, is not really been part of the federal authorization process for a number of years now and that as a funding agency the thing that we look for in terms of priorities is we look at the, the regional transportation plan that's kind of the document that we look for prioritizing and so I think this letter is, is useful for the congressman's purposes uh, but in terms of seeking funding you know the federal government FHWA and Caltrans we look at the regional transportation plan as the place to look for projects when I when I made the statement about the top four I mean all of I all of them go forward but just the f the ones that I mentioned being reordered to be the top and mentioned that here's our priority and you know encourage that to happen okay thank you I'd, I'd like to um, tell you which of these projects are in the RTP. Okay, yeah, I was wondering. Um, so all of them in one form or another are in the RTP. The one that is um, probably hits the lowest in, in missing it um, is the HTA which also keep in mind we were not as um, on the cutting edge the last time we did the RTP and thinking forward about electrification of our vehicles. Um, but we do have in the RTP a project for a solar PV system. It just isn't, a, a, they didn't think as big as a whole microgrid. So um, that, that is the one that is a little bit of a shadow of itself. Um, the Eureka Highway 101 Waterfront Drive Corridor Revitalization Project, the one you see before you right now, again, is a little bit grander in scope, but we do have projects in our Complete Streets element about the South Gateway in Eureka and the Waterfront Drive G to J. And then also um, the McKinleyville Road Safety, again, I think what what these do is they bundle them in ways that speak to the funding that we are aspiring to. So for the McKinleyville Road Safety one, it includes at least five, uh, five different projects that are in our list, but as separate projects. But there is a, there are three different Central Avenue projects. There's a McKinleyville Avenue Extension project, and then some other ones that um, are, don't have as much specific detail, but but say these should be complete completed streets. Um, Garberville Redway Drive. We have a Garberville Garberville downtown project, which is basically for connectivity and complete streets. The Hammond Bridge replacement is in the RTP. The Annie and Mary Trail Phase Two and Three are absolutely in the RTP. Um, also in our bike plan. New Navy Base Road Rehabilitation Project is in the RTP, not just um, under the county's complete streets, but uh, in our, uh, I believe we call it goods movement now, the Harbor District also talks about upgrading that. And the uh, Fortuna Kenmar, again, is in our RTP in at least three different projects, uh, all the interchanges that and the one thing is that um, all the prices have gone up. Okay, thank you. So what do we think? Do we want to move these all forward? Or does 
anyone want to try to go one, two, three, four? I think we should move them all forward. I think we should move them all forward, although I have to admit I love Paul's idea. <laughs> and having driven in Garberville recently, I can definitely see the need for that. I mean, it was interesting to say the least. There was places, I think, where the center line was below the lip of gutter. So you can't get the water off the road, you're in trouble. You know, uh, maybe an option is we don't say the priority, we just move these around so that the first one they see is Kenmar instead of the last one, you know. Yeah, that, I mean, that makes I, some I'm sense just, because there's yeah. just, when things are listed for some reason, you think there's an order, yeah. even if there isn't. It's implied. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to notice that they aren't numbered or lettered, and so there is sort of a, there's not a sequence of saying this is a higher priority, but you're right, the, the appearance does make a difference and I would I would certainly move that that concept forward um, of moving that project up the list thank you so what are we saying so are we saying Fortuna's number one yeah I'm trying to think we're to yeah I don't think that we're implying I but don't think we need to state that it's our highest priority but by simply listing it there it it becomes apparent that that is an important project and I think for a number of reasons uh, it would be good and then I would list the McKinley projects right behind that because I think all of those are good too and there seems to be keen interest um, from that the um, and I think a cover letter indicating that we that, that the TAC has done a really good job at pulling together really important projects from around the county once once this moves out beyond us, however, we list it as a priority is going to vanish. So this is mostly a good feel for us at this stage. But the reality is, is that we're going to be competing with lots and lots of jurisdictions across the country for funding. Um, and all of these projects have merit. It's really going to be a matter of how things get developed and the, the people who would analyze the projects that are presented. I think I would note, as we send them on, that they are in the RTP. Right. I was thinking right. the same thing. So that, make sure that is taken into account that they're in our plan. And reality is, regardless of the order they're in, when it comes time to scratch for funding, it's going to the dollars and the project are going to come together, whichever one fits. But my motion stands if somebody's going to second that for relisting. So maybe can you um, restate your motion? Yeah, to to move the um, Kenmar and 12th Street interchange modernization project to the front of the list um, because I sensed that there was a, a great amount of support collectively from the group for that. It meets the... Um, um, HCOG's list on projects and the fact that it came in at the end should not be served as a detriment to to how we feel that it could be done so there's my motion I'll second that okay we have a motion and a second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. 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 okay approved Um, so next we have we are going to reconvene as the HCOG board and by a motion the HCOG board will approve the PAC recommendations Do we have a motion I make a motion that we approve the PAC recommendations we have a motion and a second all those in favor say aye aye, aye. aye. okay now we're on nine HCOG staff and PAC member reports a is Caltrans report on the 101 corridor project. Jeff Pimentel is here to speak on uh, this item. Hello, thanks for having me today. Um, <clears throat> so last time I came, I believe there was a um, question or a request for an update on where Caltrans is with the sea level rise planning condition. Um, 
as part of our Coastal Commission federal consistency. But first, before I get into that, I'll just give an update. Um, so on August 7th, we did have our Coastal Development Permit hearing here in Eureka, and happy to report it was successful. Uh, the Commission approved our Coastal Development Permit, so that was a very nice um, milestone to reach and wanted to give kudos to all the Caltrans staff as well as our partners in HCOG collaborating with us to reach that really big uh, milestone. So there was a lot of work that went into meeting the four consistency conditions. And um, the only change that they made was with regards to sea level rise. So any of you that either attended or heard, read some articles, um, there were some slight adjustments. One was uh, the condition had read we needed to develop and submit a sea level rise adaptation plan for the corridor by 2030 and that was sped up to 2025. And there also was a requirement to do biennial uh, reporting in terms of water elevation data, um, any kind of hazard response that we've had in the corridor, um, and some other mainly data-driven reporting in terms of sea level rise in, in the corridor. And that'll be every year now, so that'll be a yearly report that Caltrans will be submitting to the Coastal Commission. And the other change was they added language to um, have Caltrans not only collaborate with mun municipalities, other stakeholders such as businesses and the public, but also non-governmental organizations. So um, that is other language that was added to the condition. So while we don't have our issued CDP yet, they are amending that language and we'll be including that. So we expect to have our coastal development permit within about two weeks. Um, and uh, last, I was here also, I had provided, um, so I guess going off of that on the sea level rise would be a good tie in there. So our planning department, Brad Medham, our deputy D district director of planning, will be leading the effort with his staff in terms of the sea level rise long range planning that is conditioned as part of the project, but it's more becoming, it's not a project issue, it is a corridor and department issue that we need to develop and work on with our partners such as HCOG, municipalities, the businesses, the private landowners, um, as well as the what they, we title NGOs and non-governmental organizations that have an interest as well. So that is going to be something that we will be starting as a part of that condition. So I think on a um, sea level rise is a difficult subject to move forward because it's um, the consequences are with respect to how we normally program and fund and work on projects very far into the future and the way our funding and mechanisms are set up is for more immediate needs and reaction based and so this is a little bit different in terms of a lot of planning into the future when our funding is very constrained based on needs we have now so no doubt the department and our governments and the way we fund projects is going to need to adapt to that the same way that we need to adapt to sea level rise. Um, and so I'm sure there'll be a lot of change that comes uh, from this. But what's exciting, you know, Caltrans is committed to leading the charge here locally in the corridor to um, kind of take the lead on sea level rise and collaborate with our partners. And now that there's a condition, I think it's really good for the community and all of us at large that there's a formalization for how we're going to deal with it and accountability built into that. And so as we're trying to collaborate with all of our partners, we have language and a condition that we can reflect to to kind of guide everyone through the process. Um, so anyway, we're excited about it and uh, look forward to seeing what, what comes of it. And no doubt it will be something that occurs for many years. And uh, I don't know that we'll ever just be done with it, but um, we'll We'll take it on and, and start collaborating with everyone. Um, I wanted to also give an update. I think at the last time I was here, I mentioned we had some um, update in terms of soil conditions for the Indianola undercrossing in terms of uh, significant settlement that we weren't necessarily anticipating to the degree that uh, it appears that we'll have. And so um, I didn't, I wasn't able to speak to actual costs when I was here last, but Marcel has definitely been in the loop with us and we've had a series of meetings with her as well as Caltrans headquarters and funding staff to um, kind of assess the impact. So 
shortly after I came here, we assessed the impact in terms of cost with this news at approximately $34 million um, of additional costs related to the issue. Since then, we've been working with our engineering staff and it's been elevated to management and headquarters Sacramento, the, about as high as we can take it. And um, we've been really um, looking at the design and developing ways that we can reduce that cost and being trying to find innovative ways to essentially deal with that soil consolidation. And so it's been a kind of a cross-section between our geotechnical staff, our structures engineers, and our roadway design staff because each change has, they're all interconnected in terms of how we deal with our traffic staging, how we construct large fill slopes that are 20 feet tall with traffic, you know, adjacent to that, and how we manage all of that at the same time building a project in the middle of uh, our busiest, you know, <laughs> route in, in District 1. So at this time, we were, we've were we been able to reduce that cost to about $21 million of uh, total overrun from what we have programmed at this time. And we're still exploring additional options. We actually have a meeting tomorrow that Marcella will be attending with our headquarters programming staff as well as CTC staff to look at. Uh, that's more not looking at engineering options for reducing the cost, but we're working also on funding strategies looking at is there a way for the shop program to potentially contribute to this increase or potentially some of the increase and and so we're really looking at every single option options we may not necessarily ever have utilized in the past but our goal um, as a department in Caltrans and partnering with HCOG is to not delay this project because of the funding shortfall but find a way to have a fully funded project and so we are engaging um, headquarters management in this and everyone's aware and it's a top priority to solve this problem not only leaning up the estimate and reducing the cost as much as possible while also delivering the project that we've committed to, to delivering the public to enhance safety at the location but also finding an innovative funding strategy so that we can bring this project to the community on time so um, I'll have more uh, in the coming weeks and I expect and next time we can give you additional updates, but that's where we stand at this time. Any Anyone questions? Board? Questions? I'd like to just ask a question. Um, the, the day after you got your okay for the, this sea <coughs> level rise from the Coastal Commission, they came out with a, uh, um, they, we had a gentleman give us a presentation on sea level rise at the Coastal Commission meeting the next day, and it was rather terrifying. Um, and it, they came out of it, uh, I heard him say that, oh boy, we've got to look back at the uh, Highway 101 project. Did anything change due to that, what the Coastal Commission heard the next day, do you know? Of? No, so um, to the ex when we look at the recommendation for sea level rise, we've incorporated the elements from the studies and information we have into the design of the features that are in that project, the safety features. So the structure, the Indianola intersection, those all are all planning for mostly the high mid to high level projections of sea level rise in the year 2100 as well as at the Jacoby Creek structure that we're replacing um, but um, no changes in terms of conditions or anything on our coast development permit of change since I believe it was probably Alderon Laird that made the presentation and I, I wasn't at the, the meeting that day but um, so nothing's changed but all the information he shared is information. I'm kind of um, making an assumption here, but I'm sure he's speaking from the studies he's done, the information that he has, which is the information that our engineers, the Department, Coastal Commission are all referencing as well. So it should be information that Caltrans and all of our partners are aware of and are planning for. But we've implemented the design features that we can from. Um, the information we have and no doubt there's other vulnerable areas in the corridor that we're not touching at this time and so that's kind of the distinction between this is a safety project to deal with certain safety needs and locations but there's also a corridor wide issue that's a sea level rise issue that um, the condition we have is you know um, going to formalize how we deal with that process with our partners just as an additional to this it would be very nice if we could hear that presentation. I think if 
we need to have a, you know an opportunity to understand sea level rise and maybe get scared to death by it. It'd be nice to have him present that. I don't know how we how we could do that, but that was really a fascinating talk. Yeah, I think Eldoran is pretty accessible in the community, um, and I'm sure Marcella. Um, I'd, be, I'd be happy to even uh, collaborate with her on contacting him and seeing if he'd be interested in doing that. I'm sure he probably would be. He's gone up and, and spoke at various venues before. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further questions, Stephen? So what I'm gathering is that the, uh, the project is moving forward, and as you said, this is a safety project. However, the Coastal Commission, in giving its permit, wants you to recognize that there is a sea level change issue and that your designs need to take that and factor that in so that as other aspects of the corridor are worked on in the future, that it would dovetail with those so that there would be sort of a seamless process of addressing sea level change along the entire corridor. Yeah, so any future project that we would have in the corridor, and we don't have any at this date other than the ones that are programmed, and actually three of those, the cable median barrier, the acceleration deceleration lanes, as well as the um, Jacoby Creek Cannon Slough projects, which actually were scheduled to deliver and finish tomorrow to get ready to go out to bid. Um, there are no other projects at this time, but should there be, since in the coastal zone, we'd have to get a coastal development permit and we'd have to go through the same process. There would obviously be some nexus between the uh, adaptation plan that we're working on and depending on, um, I'm going to make an assumption that, you know, we're not going to likely have any new projects in the corridor anytime really soon that would be safety related or um, at this time that's on our radar, but should anything pop up the status of the adaptation plan, anything that's been developed thus far to date on that would obviously probably fold into those improvements as they relate. Okay. The, the, um, the caveat to that would be if it's a safety improvement that we just need to implement and make an improvement to the existing facility that isn't sea level rise contingent like a cable median barrier or acceleration deceleration lanes that are features to the existing um, asset that we have at, at that time uh, or that we have out there now okay thank you mm -hmm. appreciate that i was just curious given the proximity to the bay and the type of soils that are there because it's basically a highway through the wetland area i mean it was built a long time ago the railroad actually drove it probably but what was the anticipated settlement and then what what did you find out when the geotechs got in there what the re, uh, their estimated settlement level is going to be so i don't we didn't have an anticipated settlement amount to a depth so this information came from the actual drilling that was done at the site so it was really the first piece of data that we had with the project um, now did we expect that the soils were soft Sure, um, but I don't believe that our geotechnical staff and the engineers in the department had expected up to eight feet of settlement. Um, so, um, you know, there were some other locations with data further, I believe, north that um, at certain depths they had hit some bedrock, um, not quite as at a certain depth. And I believe at this location they went down 150 feet and were still hitting, you know, this bay mud material. So it typically sometimes at some depth we expect to hit bedrock where we can have our piles for our structures foundation bear on that. With this, all of our structures uh, strength in terms of the bearing capacity for the piles is all relying on skin friction. We're not going to be bearing on bedrock. So that's why we have to go so deep to develop that skin friction with the surface of the piles. And, and with that also our piles are extremely large compared to what we had planned for before. So, um, and the department has made, has made changes. Um, it was um, after this project was already programmed and down its track, but something the department to kind of solve this issue is trying to do early drilling on projects. And so that is something the department has made a move to do. This project predated that change but um, this is a good case in point to where if we can get information earlier, 
then we can plan our funding better. Now, had we drilled, you know, eight, you know, I don't know, a year or two prior to this, the information would still be the same, so we'd still be running into the same issue, but it, it's challenging when you get late news to deal with change like that, especially when you think you have a fully funded project. So that's a challenge, and um, the department's aware of that, and, and they've made changes, but unfortunately this project kind of predated that change. All right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Any further comments? Okay, thanks. All right, thank you. Have a good evening. Maybe, no, are you gonna, you're not going to tell us about last chance grade. Are you going to talk about that? No, that'll be Kevin. Yeah, last chance grade. I wanted to provide a, a short update. Uh, there recently there were a, it was a team meeting with 38 stakeholders. It was a field tour on August 8th. They were looking at the terrain and vegetation on some of the alignments on the east side of last chance grade. Gordon Johnson was attending on behalf of HCOG. Uh, in terms of the schedule of the project, uh, geotechnical investigations for Phase 2A began this week. Phase 2B is on schedule for October of 2020. In November of this year, there will be a California Transportation Commission town hall meeting. They're coming up to tell Nort County to uh, visit the area, look at projects, including Last Chance Grade. Okay. Thank you. So that's last chance grade is going to be a federal earmark, isn't it? Isn't that kind of what we're thinking? The, currently, the, there's uh, the funding for environmental studies is is state funding. State funding. Okay. Okay, and then we're at nine uh, C report on Eureka Arcata one hundred one safety corridor supplement patrols. <coughs> mm -hmm. So uh, in your staff report is the information that was forwarded from the Eureka uh, Police Department on the supplemental patrols from November to July. Okay, yeah, thank you. It's interesting. Does anyone have any comments on those? We saw quite a few police out there as we were coming in today. So next we are on 9D, uh, CHP State Route 36 and 96 Supplemental Patrols 2018-19 Information Report. So just more statistics. Uh, this is a follow-up on the last time CHP attended and I believe didn't have the numbers um, split out the way that they are here. So they forwarded that to us and we present it to you. I wanted to say I appreciate them uh, um, planning to separate the warnings and the citations in the future. Um, it'd be great if we uh, knew what they were doing actually on the corridor. So, you know, we have Eureka stuff on the corridor, the supplemental patrols of Eureka. It's real detailed and info informative. But we don't know what CHP actually does on the corridor. That would be an interesting uh, thing for me to be able to look at. What what does CHP do on the corridor? What's their totals? Could I look that look at that next to what Eureka does, and um, just get a feeling for that? Are you talking about then hours on patrol, miles logged? Well, uh, probably citations and warnings would be simple enough. Citation, warning, ad address, traffic stops, that, those last four columns. If we had that for the same time period, comparing what Eureka does on its supplement to what CHP does on its standard, because I don't think we're supplementing CHP at this point on 101 corridor, Eureka Arcata corridor. I mean, this is all nice info, but really what I'd like to know is what does CHP do, do approximately during that time period and what's Eureka doing? Because the 36, uh, 96, is, that's fine. That's pretty isolated, and we don't have anything to compare it to because there's nobody else giving tickets out there. Thanks. Anyone else? Comments? 
Okay. Um, is there anyone, anyone on the board have any announcements, anything you want to make? We don't seem to have that section in here, but just in case anybody had something that they wanted to talk about. Okay. Could, could uh, I say could something for HTA? Sure. We're running the electric bus to uh, s sections of the day from a morning, uh, r early morning till noon, and then again in the afternoon. And it's uh, running from uh, CR to HSU. And uh, so far, we're getting way more miles than we had anticipated on a charge. Hmm. So okay. uh, not like what happened when we first went to hybrid buses, where we were supposed to save all this gas and all that, and none of that worked out, so we stopped buying hybrids. Mm -hmm. but these, in comparison to that, we were thinking we'd get 150 to 200 miles per charge, and we're getting up on the high end of that rather than on the low end. So as drivers learn how to drive that bus, um, it, it's real. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I'm, I like it. It feels good. Mm -hmm. It feels like it's happening the way we'd like it to happen. It's easy Great. to see on the road. You can tell which one it is. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thanks for that information. Anyone else? Okay, we're adjourned.